Welcome everybody to Coffee Connection Live. We are so happy that you're here today. And um, I feel like my guest tonight needs no introduction, but we'll give her a quick one anyway, because it has been a year since we spoke. Like Danielle said, we're here with the incomparable Heidi Murkoff, author of the What to Expect series, the What to Expect app, and all things What to Expect. Heidi, we're so glad you're here. Um, so happy to be here, though I'd rather be there or wherever you are at this moment. I wish. I wish we were sitting in the same room having coffee. Mm. Alas, here we are virtually, but this is great because we can reach even more people. Um, for those who didn't join us last August, Heidi joined us for this very same show a year ago, and we spoke about all things under the sun, and today is going to be no different. So since it's been a year, Heidi, what have you been up to for the last year? <laughs> I'll tell you what I have not been up to, <laughs> and that would be traveling around the world. I guess time flies when you're not having as much fun as you used to, but yeah, we've been doing all of our, our events virtually instead of in person as we always do, and it's been amazing and there are definite silver linings to being at home because I, I get to do events without pants or shoes. Um, <laughs> no comment, <laughs> um, but I miss the hug so much and I can't wait to be back out there with all of you moms. You've been, up doing, a storm. you've been doing USO baby showers for how many years now? <sighs> okay. It was, I don't want to do the math, but it was 2013 when we had our first three showers in Okinawa. Wow. Exactly. Almost. Yeah. So that would be eight years ago this month when it was super hot in Okinawa. When isn't it? Um, and yeah, I, you know, this story, but the air conditioning was broken at the USO center for the whole three days we were there. And so it was, it was, a, it was completely amazing experience, but a very sweaty one, especially all for, you know, for all the moms who are heating for two when they're pregnant and in uniform, that was a little bit challenging, mm. but it was the beginning of eight incredible years so far and counting of these, you know, of celebrating military moms and there's nobody who deserves more celebration than you do. I love that. I love yeah. that. And the whole, whole reason that we're all here today, to more, this morning, this evening, wherever you are, is to make connections and to come together over this topic we can all relate on. So yeah. um, we would love for everyone who's joining us from home to write in the chat box where they're joining us from so we can make some connections. Um, and if you're comfortable sharing your LinkedIn profile, um, go ahead and throw that in there too. And maybe we can connect on LinkedIn as well. Um, so back wow. to Heidi. <laughs> yes, we want to make connections with everybody. Um, in addition to talking about all things parenthood and pregnancy, which is one of my favorite themes that we've come up with for this. Anyway, I love alliteration. Um, so Heidi, you've been parenting. How about pregnancy and parenting in a pandemic? Oh, I like that. A triple triple P. Yeah. New or title for parents for pregnancy and parenting in a pandemic. <laughs> I think is there don't. anything that can won't. prepare us for that though? Seriously. No, no. There okay, so Heidi, you have been around the world doing not only USO baby showers, but you've been around the world taking care of moms and babies for quite some time. You've been a lot of places. Um, what is the question you get asked the most from moms and moms to be? And and it's funny because the questions are always the same no matter where in the world I go. So whether it's a small village in Africa or before the pandemic, we were in Bangladesh, in India, Romania, uh, Poland, Hungary. Um, no matter where I go, it's the same kinds of questions, slightly different because of where you are, for sure. But I think for pregnant women and dads, let's face it, because they, they worry too. <laughs> they just don't own up to it as much, but yeah, they're plenty worried. It's always like, is this normal? And you can fill in the blank. There are, and that goes for new parents too, like just fill in the blank. Is this normal? Is that normal? And most of the time it is, but just knowing, I think that you're not the only one going through that experience at the moment you're going through it 
is it, it doesn't necessarily make whatever is happening at that moment go away, but it helps you cope because you know we're all in this together. And motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood. And I don't care if you're in South Sudan or South Carolina, you want the best for your baby. So for that's definitely something that I hear in many, many, many different variations. I think that's so, so true. I mean, we've all bonded over that. Anybody who's, who's had kids or who wants kids someday um, has, has bonded over that. I will never forget when my first daughter was born almost nine years ago. I was panicked for probably the first year, but um, oh, no. <laughs> one tantrum in, in particular, she was just crying and crying and crying. And I remember looking up at my mom who happened to be there and saying, well, what do I do? And she said, you'll just know your motherhood instinct will kick in. But do you know it never did? And I felt like, why not? What did I do wrong that I don't? I don't just know why my baby's crying, and I never learned the difference between the different cries. Like there's a cry for this. Uh, now she just cried all the time. That's all I. Knew. It's a cry for help from you. <laughs> so but, whatever, whatever yeah. it is, we're bonding over. It's 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 that. <laughs> no, for sure. And and I feel like there's you are so not alone in in the fact that you looked at her and like, like when Emma, when Emma gave birth to Lennox and I was there and um, she handed, she was handed Lennox and the nurse put her on Emma's chest and she, and Emma looked panicked and said, what do I do now? And the nurse said, just love him, just love him. And honestly, that's, that's the basic you know, there are very few um, absolutes in parenting, actually only two, keep your child healthy and safe, um, which doesn't mean that there won't be times like when Emma rolled off the changing table at 3 a.m. You know, th the stuff happens. But um, if you do what you can to keep your child healthy and safe, and if you love your child unconditionally, then anything else, really, it's all good. You survive the day, it's a good day. I think you need to have t-shirts made that say, love your baby. That's yeah. it. Right. It, it's true. It's, it's, it's the only golden rule that I can think of um, besides the health and safety aspect. So yeah, I, I think we all have to cut ourselves a lot of slack and realize that, you know, bonding, loving your, you know, getting your mom legs, feeling comfortable as a mom or as a dad. This isn't something that just you give birth and, you know, the heavens open up and everything showers down on you. The instincts, you know, I know exactly what to do because I'm a mom. I call bullshit on that. <laughs> like, seriously, I have, I, I did not feel that when I gave birth. And it's a process. All of it is a process. And I think it's really important to know that going in so that you, um, you don't set your expectations way too high for yourself. I think that's super helpful. I hope everybody's taking notes right now because it's so true. <laughs> uh, now you mentioned Emma. Emma is your daughter yes. and she's also the star on the cover of the books. Is that right? Yes. Let's see if I have a, yeah, exhibit A. Yeah, she's, um, she hasn't always been, but when she happened to get pregnant not nine years ago, because Lennox is eight and she you know, she happened to be pregnant at the right time because I was doing a whole new edition of what to expect when you're expecting. And there she is on the cover of what to expect. Lennox is on the cover of first year. So he was in the right uterus at the right time too. He's so yeah. proud of that, I'm sure. So you and Emma have a podcast um, that people can find online. Can we hear a little bit about that? So not surprisingly, it's called the What to Expect Podcast. <laughs> and yeah, we talk about everything, including, you know, those first months as, as a new mom, uh, you know, all your pregnancy worries, all of your new mom worries, and, and just also about being a mom today and how, or a parent today, and, and how challenging that sometimes is because there's so much pressure and social media telling you what to do or what to feel and how you should look. And it's, it's a lot. So we try to cut through all of that because you're the best mom your kid ever had. That's just a fact. 
that's a fact. So there's no such thing as a perfect mom. There's no such thing as a perfect dad. And, you know, you can just do the best that you can do. And that's, that's great. So you mentioned the first few months after having a baby. And I have heard that that can also be referred to as the fourth trimester. So can you talk a little bit about why that's called the fourth trimester and what new moms and dads might be dealing with? Yeah, for those of you who might like get panicked and say, wait, you want to add another trimester? <laughs> Are you crazy? Three was plenty enough for me. Thank you very much. Um, but actually, it's great that they've started speaking about postpartum instead of in, you know, oh, you know, you're six weeks recovery. Well, nobody recovers in six weeks. That's, that's crazy talk. Um, it takes you know, a minimum of another trimester to recover from the first three trimesters. And that's, that's not, you know, you're just getting warmed up then. You, um, you need to be alert to your body and alert to your mind and realize that um, you, have to, you, you have to listen to your body. Your body has been through a lot and is still going through a lot. And, you know, we hear too much about like snapping back or you know, getting your mom sexy back or whatever it is. No, you need to take your time. If, like I said, if you get through the day, that's, that's a good day. And you need to cut yourself lots and lots and lots of slack um, and, and, you know, and, and a piece of cheese, quite frankly, because you need the protein, you need the energy. Um, those 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 three months and the months that follow as well, uh, you know, there's no pressure to lose weight. There's there should be no pressure to keep the house clean. Anything besides getting through that day and loving your baby should be like just extra credit that you don't need to earn. So, what are some of the ways that moms and dads? can take care of themselves when it just feels like their lives and their schedules have been completely not just turned upside down but then dumped out all over the floor and scattered yes. and you just feel like you're doing whatever you can to make sure that the baby is okay what's what are some ways that that the parents can step back and take some time for themselves at that point point? and you know it's important because first of all physically you have to recover and emotionally, this is a whole new ball game. Plus, you know, let's face it, one out of six moms also suffer from some form of postpartum mood disorder. Um, and, and often we don't pay much attention because, you know, we're new moms, we have to tough it out, we have to be strong. But that's why it's so important to listen to your, the little voice inside of you when you think something isn't, isn't right. But it means, you know, sometimes putting your baby in an infant seat safely strapped in and plunking that in front of the shower and taking a shower. Like if that's going to make you feel better, we've all heard, you know, nap when your baby naps, like, and everybody takes a big, like, chuckle and rolls their eyes. Um, so even if you're not a napper or you feel like that's the last thing you can do at that moment, just remember the dust bunnies can breed. Let them breed. You don't need to keep the house clean. You, you that's why, you know, takeout was invented, you know, Grubhub, whatever. So you, you need to, to make things as easy as possible on yourself. And even if it's five minutes of, of stretching and a little yoga and closing your eyes, um, as long as your baby's safe. You need to take that time for yourself. And as for the two of you as a couple, first of all, parenting is a two person job if there are two people in the house. So if your partner's employed, that makes it extra, extra hard. But if your partner is there, then he needs to be doing half of the parenting. And I feel like it's sort of up to us to let them do that. There's too often like a kind of maternal gatekeeping mechanism that that we do where you know we complain all the time that he doesn't do anything you never do anything you know and then as soon as he tries to do something you're doing it all wrong 
And that's, that's part of the problem because there's nothing that a mom can do that a dad can't do just as well, if not better, given the opportunity. So if you do this incredibly hard job together, again, when there are two people, then it, it's, it's a great bonding opportunity for the three of you, but also for the two of you. It's like I always say, you know, babies, fetuses are going to grow up into babies. Babies are going to grow up and move away from home. But your partner is yours, hopefully, with some nurturing also, because relationships need nurturing for the rest of your life. So that's why, you know, don't stick it on the back burner. I'm not even suggesting I'm not even talking about sex. I'm not talking about, you know, date nights or wild weekends away. I'm just talking about cuddling on the couch for a few minutes or grabbing his butt or, you know, holding his hand or any kind of touching that reminds you that you're not just a couple of parents, but that you're also still a couple. I think that's helpful. I love that. Easy love for that. me to say, but... 39 years later, it's all good in the hood, in our hood, so. I mean, you must've done something, right? <laughs> I, well, we did make that time for each other. We did, um, religiously, and it had nothing, we couldn't afford date night, so it wasn't about that. It was just about making that time to talk, to communicate. Um, sex is just icing on the cake, but it's not even what I'm most focused on. It's more the, the other kind of intimacy. So I, I feel like lately it's become more acceptable to talk about dual parenting roles instead of just this society norm of, of the mom doing everything and bringing yeah. dad into it more or bringing the second partner into it more. Um, and, and you mentioned postpartum before and, and how that, that that's very much an isolating an isolating um, feeling, but do dads experience postpartum or, or I should say the parent who didn't give birth, is it possible that they experience it too? Absolutely. What a, a lot of people don't realize is that dads actually partners, the non-pregnant uh, one, go through biological hormonal changes during pregnancy and postpartum. So for guys, they experience a surge in estrogen and a drop in testosterone. This is something that, you know, might not be perceptible as, you know, as perceptible as it is when you're pregnant and your hormones are really, but they do, they do experience these hormonal changes. And sometimes it's a matter of, you know, they're craving a lot, a lot of extra ice cream. That's the estrogen talking. Maybe they gain a few pounds, but they can also have mood swings, legit. Um, sometimes it's, you know, because of circumstances, because money's all of a sudden tighter, because your relationship is not maybe what it was and there's, it's not comparable, it's different. And it can be good different, but it's definitely going to be different. Um, and that's hard for a lot of couples to, to cope with, but there are biological reasons why guys go through these hormonal sh shifts and it's to bring out the nurture and the male of the species. Um, so it can, it, but because they're not expecting it, it can take them by surprise and they might not deal with it in, or process it in the way that women do. And let's face it, women by and large don't speak up when they're feeling sad. Um, when you're a new mom and you think you have to be mom strong and then you're, you have to be military mom strong, which is like the biggest burden of all, um, when being strong sometimes means just asking for help. But yeah, usually moms and dads don't go through postpartum mood disorders at the same time probably a protective measure from you know mother nature so if the dad's experiencing it often the, the mom is not and vice versa um but it's it's legitimate and it needs you know attention often therapy sometimes medication depending on the situation to um to be at your your happy in your happy place that you need to be in, deserve to be in, that your baby needs you to be in. 
So always speak up and get that help. And also keep in mind, you know, in terms of postpartum, we all talk about postpartum depression, but that it manifests in so many other different ways, like anxiety disorder, OCD, you know, these racing thoughts that some moms have. So postpartum PTSD, there's lots of different ways that it can show up and all of them can be treated. There's not one postpartum mood disorder that, that, that can't be treated. It's just a matter of finding the right, you know, therapy. So speak up and get that help. No stigma, whether you're a dad or a mom, no stigma. So we have parents who have moved maybe while pregnant or maybe just before having the baby um, and they, they are in a new duty station and this is just a hypothetical. Um, they don't know their neighbors or they don't live near anybody um, military who understands the lifestyle and they feel it. They know something's happening. It is the best thing to reach out to their, their primary care doctor or do, do you know if there are resources on base they can look for? Yeah, I feel like it should be as easy as reaching out to your care provider, your OB, um, or the pediatrician. I mean, pediatricians are supposed to screen for postpartum mood disorders because pediatricians see moms and dads more often than OBs do once a baby's delivered. Um, and so they are kind of like the first line of defense. But at the same time, if you don't get the response, I've only heard anecdotally some moms saying, you know, I reached out, you know, they kind of said, oh, it's normal, you're fine. Just don't take that for an answer, I would say. Um, there, there are resources and depending, you know, on, on where you're based, uh, it's something that should be available to every mom and dad who needs it. We can't carry around that stigma and even in the military, especially in the military. You know, military moms in general are at, uh, are at greater risk for postpartum mood disorders. And that's not surprising given all of those you just, what the just You just uh, described because you are isolated. You are far from your family and friends and your network of support. But that's why it's so important that you do these connections, that moms make connections with other moms, because you know you don't have that typical support system that other families rely on, especially during COVID. Yes, it's an extra challenging. Uh, a whole a whole new topic for us to to yeah. to to get on to today. Um, I do want to make a selfless plug though for USO virtual programs at this point because there are virtual baby showers, even if you can't get to one in person. And there are virtual coffee connections. There are in-person coffee connections. So here's a shameless plug for USO programs. You can go to uso.org slash military spouse or uso.org slash MVP. Find virtual programs, find upcoming in-person programs so you can make uh, a group of friends. You can expand your networks and, and get to know other military parents who are going through the same things that you're going through. Because we're all here for each other. Just like Heidi said, we try to be resilient and tough, um, but we all need the same things. And that's a community it's surrounding us. It's so helpful to know that other moms get you because nobody gets another mom like a mom. Right? Absolutely. So if, if, if you need support, that's who you should always turn to first. Um, and also, of course, special as Jessica's pointing out, got to go to um, uh, USO slash special delivery, USO.org slash special delivery, because we do virtual showers all over the place. Um, we have many coming up, so make sure you sign up for those too. Yay. Thank you. <laughs> so should we talk about COVID and pregnancy and parenting? Because a year ago we were on here and it was you know August of 2020, we were all in the thick of it. But honestly, Heidi, when we planned this talk a few weeks ago, COVID was going away and I literally didn't even write it in my notes for us to talk about tonight because I thought by August, nobody's even gonna remember that word. So here we are in the middle of a week where it's everywhere again and it's not gonna go away right now. What are some things that that we need to know about pregnancy and parenting during a pandemic? 
First of all, I, I know a lot of people have felt kind of, you know, some disappointment about being pregnant during a pandemic. And that's, I want to just reinforce that that's completely normal and you shouldn't feel guilty about it. The fact that you've been somewhat robbed of a normal pregnancy with all the trappings and, you know, the baby showers in person and your family and friends coming to visit you. Um, that's, that, that is a little, you know, it's, it's a little hard to just accept, but there are so many silver linings uh, that we have experienced as well. And, and one of them, besides not having to like go to work and puke in the office when you're pregnant, um, because you're at home, that's, that was always a plus for a lot of moms or not having to buy a lot of maternity clothes because you, you could just wear oversized sweats. Um, that was good too. But the fact that you do get more bonding time as a family than than you might have if you know everybody was at work and family was coming to visit. Yeah, there's an upside to that, but there's also an upside in the three of you or more of you bonding as a little family unit. So I think that that has been in many ways a, a silver lining to kind of a dark cloud. But something else to remember is that. You know, initially we didn't know a whole lot about pregnancy and COVID. Um, and, and so I didn't have a lot of good answers at the time, but now we do know that, it, that pregnant women are at increased risk from a COVID infection. Um, and so it's extra important to be extra careful and also that it's safe to be vaccinated and that ACOG, the American College of OBGYNs, AAP, American Academy of Pediatrics, and the Society of Fetal Maternal Medicine are all strongly recommending that pregnant, all pregnant women get vaccinated, um, as well as moms who are breastfeeding, because there's no, there's no proven risk, there's no theoretical risk, but there is proven risk to, to getting COVID during pregnancy, because your, your, your immune system is suppressed, um, you have more potential for breathing complications. And so more moms have gotten you know, pneumonia. All the more reason to get vaccinated, also to wear your mask, which is safe to do during pregnancy, if not at all comfortable. I want to, I want to reiterate that, I get it, it's not comfortable. Um, but this is also, the other upside is that you can pass immunities onto your baby um, they found uh, antibodies in in the in the cord um, blood after uh, delivery. So you are passing on some some antibodies, which is great through breastfeeding or you know during um, your pregnancy. So that because your baby is too young to to be vaccinated against flu or COVID, it's important that we cocoon them. Um, and wear your baby, like wear your baby all the time because that, then you keep them away from germs. I, I'm a huge believer in that. Uh, so you just kind of talked about it. We, we took questions from everyone who's joining us tonight ahead of time. And, and somebody did ask, what do you recommend or advise, especially now during COVID after giving birth and on the postpartum journey? So any, any tips or advice in a COVID world for after the baby's out? Yeah, for sure, the baby wearing, that's, that's really important. And you, you should still get out because that's one of the best ways to, um, you know, wearing your baby helps with postpartum mood disorders as well. So just keep, because it, you have a lot of flow of oxytocin, that's true of dads as well. Um, but you want to stay away from, strangers or others who you're not sure of their vaccination status especially but masks you know that was another silver lining because pediatricians have always maintained that it's a good idea to wear masks around the baby if you know you're not mom or dad or sibling so just saying it, it's kind of an extra protective layer um the the hard part has been for family not being able to visit I would say, yes, it can be a silver lining depending on your family, but it can also be hard because grandparents, Some I know a lot of moms in, in the Pacific who have not had 
you know, the chance to introduce their little ones to grandparents this entire time. That is so hard. My heart breaks as a grandmother. I can't even imagine not being able to see my grandchildren during this time. So my heart goes out to you. Um, there's going to be a lot of hugs that are going to have to be had to make up hugs. Lots of makeup hugs. I foresee a grueling baby shower schedule in the next year once hugs are allowed again. Oh, yes. I mean, you won't be home at all. 365 no. baby showers. <laughs> Totally, completely. Don't mark my word for it. Mm -hmm. um, I will um, go down the list of some more questions from our registrants. And I want to remind everybody who's viewing live that if you have questions for Heidi, go ahead and put them in the Q&A box. We will have time for Heidi to answer live questions in addition to the ones that you all asked ahead of time. So um, the first question is, can you give us information on puree foods versus baby led weaning? weaning? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so... I am a huge fan of baby led weaning. And for those of you who are uninitiated in BLW, as the cool kids call it, um, basically you are letting your baby be in the driver's seat of the high chair. Like instead of, you know, pushing that spoon, you know, from the, the airplane into the hangar, the, the train through the, the tunnel, the choo-choo, through the tunnel, you are letting baby self-feed. Now, does that mean they pick up a chicken leg and get busy? Well, not necessarily. What we're talking about is giving them table foods that are baby appropriate, putting it in front of them literally on their high chair tray and letting them go at it. So that means a lot of smushing in the, between the fingers, on the face and the hair. It's messy, but it's, as far as I'm concerned, it's the best way to, to get a baby involved in solids because they're, they're uh, controlling it and they're controlling their appetite. Nobody's pushing them to eat more than they're hungry for. Um, and, and they're bringing it to the mouths themselves, which is really the way it's supposed to be. They have, you know, five utensils on each hand and they can use them pretty, pretty well. Um, so I think a lot of parents worry that if you do baby lead and babies are washable. Yes, that is so true. <laughs> um, they, they worry that if you give a baby solids that are not pureed, that the baby doesn't have teeth. So how, you know, how's the baby? Well, first of all, the first teeth are not for chewing. They're for biting, right? As you may have noticed yeah. once those first teeth come in, especially if you're breastfeeding, but that doesn't last long. Um, so they are not at all helpful, those first teeth for chewing. What you want to give your baby is anything that's gummable. So it could be a hunk of uh, ripe avocado or sweet potato. It could be some crumbled up meat. It could be, you know, I, one of the best videos I ever saw on my Facebook page was a baby who couldn't get the spaghetti into her mouth, but she was licking the sauce off the high chair table, you know, licking the spaghetti. But that's learning, you know, that's learning how to eat. It was awesome to see. Um, and eating in the beginning is all about the experience. So it's not about the nutrients because breast, breast milk or formula are the mainstay of a baby's uh, diet initially. And you can combine purees with baby led weaning. That's totally fine as well. You can stick with, with um, purees if you're more comfortable with that. But what it allows a baby do, to do is get used to a variety of, of foods and textures um, and gives them that control that ultimately you know, will translate not necessarily always inevitably uh, to an adventurous eater, but the odds are better when you have a baby led weaned baby um, that they'll be more adventurous in their eating than one who, who started on purees. Um, back in the day when I started my kids, it was all, you know, rice cereal soupy mixed with breast milk and it was disgusting looking. 
And that's not even recommended anymore. Even if you're doing purees, they should be like sweet potato or avocado, something that is um, far more nutritious and tastes like something because babies develop their taste early on. So you can skip the salt and the sugar, but all of those tastes, including our, you know, foods that, that doctors once said were allergenic. So like eggs, if your doctor says, go for it, go for it. Like soft scrambled eggs are a great food for babies. Shredded cheese. Yogurt is a finger food. Give your baby some whole milk yogurt in a in the high chair and let them lick their fingers. I mean, it's it's all it's all about the experience. So you said that babies um, tastes taste buds develop early. How in important? Utero, actually. So how important is it for uh, pregnant moms and breastfeeding moms to eat a wide variety of foods? I mean, can the baby really <clears throat> taste it? To a certain extent in the amniotic fluid, because they do swallow amniotic fluid, um, to, more, uh, to a greater extent when you're breastfeeding. So breast milk takes on sometimes even the color of what you're eating. So, you know, the green Gatorade or whatever, or the kale can turn into green breast milk. Um, great for St. Patrick's Day, right? Uh, or any day. But the, but the point is that they do, they do get a taste which makes sense if you think about, you know, babies in India like curry. Why? Because they've gotten a taste for it. Or, you know, spicy this or salon, whatever seasoning that, that you use a lot of, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they'll, they'll get a taste for. So that, that's, that's fascinating. So I, I have two little girls and I've always loved salmon. So when I was pregnant with both of them, I ate salmon regularly. But I have one kid who hates it and one kid who it is my, my six-year-old, it's her favorite food. Wherever we go, she wants fish. She wants salmon. So I, that just came to mind. I mean, I, I nursed my second one for a year and I never really thought about it with the exception of people telling me don't, don't drink wine because then it would affect the baby. But I never really stopped and thought if I was getting enough variety that my kids were getting to taste different things. Yeah. But the thing is, if you're pregnant and all you can get down are saltines or like Sour Patch Kids, like go for it. Like I have no, you know, don't try to eat a fairy diet if you're, if it makes you sick. But if you can, and if you, you know, if you enjoy carrots, eat carrots because the studies do show that babies who got used to that taste um, during pregnancy and in breast milk are more likely to be open to those tastes. Now it didn't work two for two with the salmon, but anecdotally and through research, it seems to hold to more often than not. They're both really good eaters, though. I can't complain at all. They eat a variety of things, but it's just very interesting on the salmon because one likes it and one doesn't. <laughs> um, somebody else who's joining us tonight asked, is it normal to feel cramps during your 14th week with a pregnancy of twins? So... With, with twins, actually with any baby, you can feel all kinds of aches and pains, um, but you're more likely to feel them during a twin pregnancy because there's a lot of growing going on. Um, so cramps, it's hard to say without, you know, you should check with your doctor always about anything that concerns you. Um, typically, it, it, it could be round li ligament pain, you know, the, the stretching pain could be, um, you know, back pain, it could be constipation, it could be gas, it could be any number of things that are going to be multiplied in a multiple pregnancy. Um, but if you're ever concerned about an ache or pain, uh, when in doubt, just check it out. Don't sit at home worrying about it. Chances are it's absolutely nothing, um, you know, unless it's really increasing in intensity or you have some kind of discharge, but I, I would always err on the side of caution. Okay. Um, someone asked, how do you heal from diastasis recti? And I don't even know if yeah. I said that right. <laughs> yeah, Di yeah, diastasis recti. So um, it's basically happens in a significant minority of, of postpartum moms. It happens during pregnancy 
for most, but a serious, what is a separation of the abdominal muscles? And um, it makes sense because you stretch, 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 and your abdominal muscles can't, can't take the pressure anymore and they separate. Um, so that's more than likely to happen. It, it depends on the degree, the, how large the separation is, whether you need therapy for it. Um, here, I'm gonna put in a plug for pelvic floor therapists. I think can be extremely helpful, um, not just postpartum, but even during pregnancy. And especially if you're having a lot of hip pain or rib pain or any kind of pain, back pain, um, pelvic pain, uh, pelvic floor therapist, you can get a referral from your OB or your midwife, I think can be extremely helpful. There are exercises that you can do at home um, to close the separation, but if it's a large separation, you might as well go get some help for it. But again, I would visit a pelvic floor therapist if you can, regardless, whether you've had a C-section, whether you've had a vaginal birth, if you can get in to see one, it's always a good idea. Okay, thank you for that. Um, <laughs> we had one question come in. I don't know if this is gonna be a sore spot. Will you be doing in-person baby showers in Illinois? Well, I have many times before. So the hope is yes. Um, the reality is COVID's got to get under control and everybody's got to get vaccinated. So my hugging privileges can be uh, reinstated. That's really important to me. I mean, it's a little bit selfish, but it's true. I want to hug you and I want to snuggle your babies. And at the moment, we have to get the whole country healthy, the world actually, because I have big plans around the world. Do you have tips to encourage bottle feeding for a 10 week old baby that used to take a bottle, but then stopped? Oh my God, this is the hardest. Liz, did you ever, ever have issues with bottle feeding and breast? My first daughter, um, I couldn't breastfeed her. We had lots of issues and she had no choice but to do a bottle. Yes. My second one was exclusively breastfed. So yes, I had, I had the issues. <laughs> You've had both journeys. Yes. So yeah, I in fact um, was a human pacifier for a year with both kids. They never took a pacifier or a bottle. Um, now for me, it was fine because I was working at home. So I, it wasn't like I had to go back to work and pump milk or anything like that. Um, and it was actually easier in the end because I didn't have to wean them off bottles. But when you have a timeline or you just want to get out once in a while, you know, for longer than two hours at a time um, and leave the baby with a sitter or whatever, um, it, you know, it's a great idea. And obviously this mom started the bottle early on, which is what you should do once you know breastfeeding is established but i wouldn't wait longer than two weeks to get a, a newborn on a bottle because otherwise there's nothing like mama and they become really stubborn and set in their ways um sometimes and this happens a lot a baby who will take a bottle will stop taking it or will never take one and it just becomes this like stress factor and the Babies are, even newborns who weren't born yesterday, they have a radar for that stress. So if they feel like mom really wants this, like I, and they feel that stress, then they're going to react in a negative way, even if they're 10 weeks old. So you've got to like try to maintain a chill pill around them so that they don't feel that the pressure is on to use the bottle. Um, because they weren't born yesterday, they know that mom's breasts feel better, taste better, like everything about them feels good. And so it's, you know, it's having a, a synthetic in your mouth is, is just not the same. A lot of times if you have a different, someone who's not lactating offer the bottle, that can help. So it could be dad, it could be someone else who doesn't have that smell, that certain something, something. Babies can sniff that a mile away. Um, that can help, but also giving the bottle 
trying at different times. So often parents try to give it instead of a breastfeeding. And if a baby's really fussy and hungry, then they're going to be less likely to take the bottle. But instead, like, you know, sort of let them play with it a little, you know, when, when there's nothing really invested in it, they've, they've recently been fed or between feedings, or when a baby's sleepy, or even still sleeping, like try to get the bottle in their mouth and see what happens. Sometimes they're too, you know, sleepy to even know what hit them. Um, that's the hope. Also paste bottle feeding, which more mimics um, breastfeeding. So you hold a, a baby up more, so you're not, um, and you hold the, the, the bottle so that the, often with a bottle, the milk comes out too fast. So a slower flow sometimes works better for a breastfed baby. Um, but also taking breaks because in breastfeeding, there are breaks built in Whereas with bottle feeding, it's just like shove that bottle in your mouth until they finish it. Changing sides, anything that makes it feel more skin to skin, anything that makes, except for a mom, makes it feel more like breastfeeding might be the ticket. Um, and also sometimes when a mom goes back to work, a baby will start accepting it and sometimes not. And sometimes, it, you know, babies at daycare eats very little during the day, but makes up for it during breastfeedings the rest of the time. Ultimately, a hungry baby is gonna eat. I love it. And I, I Leah said this was really helpful. So you're already helping uh, everyone who's tuned in live. And just so everyone knows, this is gonna be recorded and you'll be able to find it on the USO's YouTube channel after we're done tonight. Um, I'm gonna check in with Danielle, who's our behind the scenes producer. I see that we have a couple questions in the Q&A box. Yes. One is going back to, was it BLW? Did I get it right? Am I yes, cool kid? Okay. Led weaning. <laughs> I'm so proud with acronyms, especially because the military has so many different acronyms than, than the rest of us do. Like the CDC is not centers for disease control. It's, you know, the child development centers, you know, stuff like that. Just well, we all learned. You yes. Right. We all learned a new one. Um, someone is wondering about when is a good time to start that around what month for baby? Great question. Six months is when you should start solids, whether you're doing purees or whether you're doing um, baby led weaning, doesn't really matter. As long as the baby can sit well propped up, you know, in a high chair, they, they have to be able to sit in a high chair, however, because you don't want a baby slumped forward. Um, that's not going to work out well for anyone. Um, and that's actually the best time in, in terms of introducing solids to avoid allergies, six months is best. So we used to start babies sooner, like four months. Um, ACOG rec AAP recommends six months for introducing solids. And I also wanna mention one thing. Um, a lot of people get worried about gagging, you know, and and I agree it's scary, but gagging and choking are two different things. So you have to be aware that when a baby gags, it's their way of like, if they put too much in their mouths, they'll gag. But that doesn't mean they can't breathe. Choking is a whole different story and babies can choke on lots of things that are not food, which is why you need to take baby CPR classes to know what you do in case of choking. But um, gagging is super common when you're introducing uh, solids. And as long as you know that it's not choking, you're good. So big distinction. Thanks, Heidi. I'll throw another one in here. Someone else is wondering, and again, I may butcher this one as well, de Quervain's syndrome. Um, she's worried she had it with her first pregnancy and is wondering if she will get it with her second. So I'm not sure if you're familiar with that or have any thoughts on that one. No, but, but I do want to know what, if they can explain, that would be great. Maybe they can type it up in the chat box real quick, yeah. whoever asked that question. Yes, feel free to throw that in the chat or as another question, we'll keep an eye on both for you. But in the meantime, Heidi, someone else is wondering how you got started working with military families. So maybe you could tell us a bit about that. 
Well, what happened was um, actually uh, we got a call from a friend of a friend who wondered if we could donate books to another kind of baby shower by another, another different organization for military moms at Fort Belvoir. And uh, we look, Eric and I looked at each other and said, well, maybe we can just go. So we got on a plane and we went to Fort Belvoir and I was immediately hooked, like just hugging all the moms and seeing all the babies and realizing how important these showers were for military moms and, and how, how much they deserve the celebration and the honoring and the support. And so a couple of days later, we got a meeting at the Pentagon. <laughs> it was like, just, I don't know, we made a few calls and all of a sudden we were at the Pentagon with all the branches saying, we wanna do this all the time. And they suggested getting in touch with the USO couple of days later, we were at the USO and we had our first baby shower just like a few months later. So it was really quick, but we knew immediately that we wanted to do this all the time because, because it's hard being pregnant under the best of circumstances or becoming a new parent under the best of circumstances. But for the challenges that military moms face, which by the way, I didn't fully understand. I kind of intellectually knew a little bit, but you don't fully understand until you meet moms and speak to them and hear their stories and, and, and hear about their challenges. And that's, you know, that's why it just became more and more and more important um, to, to offer that support, but also to be an advocate, which we have continued to be um, as much as possible, like in Congress, wherever we go, just talking about how much more military families deserve from us. Um, and that goes for spouses, that goes for kids, like they're all serving, right? That's an important message for everybody, every civilian in this country to understand. And I'm determined to make sure that they get it. Jessica just wrote it in the chat box and I was thinking it at the same time, your advocacy work is really, really appreciated on behalf of military families everywhere. Thank you for all of that. It, it really does make a difference in our lives and you're, you're paying it forward. To it. You need, you deserve all of it and more. So we're going to keep going, just get warmed up. <laughs> thousands of hugs down and thousands more to go. Exactly. I think we found the, the definition of the syndrome that we were talking about. Danielle, do you want to go back to that? Yeah, thanks, Liz. Um, we got a Google uh, search uh, teamwork here, but um, our, the, the asker of the question also clarified that she was told um, it is tendon inflammation. And oh. for her in particular, she was told it was the onset was brought on by pregnancy hormones and then holding her newborn. And as oh, she yes, shared that yes, in yes, the chat, yes. Okay. yeah, someone else had the same experience. Yeah, so pregnancy um, bestows so many blessings besides a baby blessing. And eh, that can be one of them um, because the body in preparation for childbirth um, the body produces a lot of the hormone relaxin, which literally is what it sounds like it is. It relaxes the, the muscles and ligaments and in joints in, in order to accommodate a baby's birth. Hopefully that's fingers crossed. That's what happens is that everything stretches, but the downside, um, is that everything stretches in all the wrong places and becomes um, too relaxed. And when you, you have a new baby and you, you've got all those aches and pains, and when you start holding your baby a lot and perhaps not always in the best way with the best support, that, that can just aggravate it a lot. And so I, I feel like physical therapy is often the answer for a lot of these aches and pains. Um, which I'm sure and I'm hoping that she has sought um, because that can make a world of difference. But, you know, 
you'll get it in all different kinds of places. A lot of people get problems with their hips after birth um, or before birth as well. Um, and sometimes compression is the answer for that. But again, you know, you got to talk to your doctor and, and don't take, we can't do anything about this for an answer because a lot of times a, a postpartum woman's concerns are dismissed and should not be. You know, it doesn't have to be part of the package. I think we have a couple more questions in the Q and A box. So let's keep going. If that's okay with you, Heidi. Absolutely. All right. Perfect. I'll keep them coming. And thank you for that answer. Other people are realizing as you speak about it that they too <laughs> have experienced that. So appreciate yeah. you. All right, the next one and congratulations to this person. They are 15 weeks pregnant with twins, but she feels she's only showing when she's bloated. Is that normal? Oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. I remember when I was pregnant, it wasn't with twins, but it was one baby. But one day I would look pregnant and the next day I wouldn't look pregnant. And it was because I was bloated or I wasn't bloated or as constipated, or I wasn't constipated anymore. And it was like this come and go belly. Um, you cannot tell a baby or babies by its cover. That's the most important thing you, you can know. Um, and a lot of women don't show significantly, whether they're having twins or single baby, there's a lot of growing on going on inside, but you won't necessarily see it from the outside. And when I say you can't tell a baby by its cover, you can carry in any number of different ways. And people will say, oh, you're carrying so small, you're carrying so big. Oh, are you having twins? You're only having one or vice versa. You can't be having twins, you're so small. Do not listen to any of that because the only opinion that matters is the doctor's or midwife's opinion when they assess your baby's growth. Um, and so the rest of it, and even that's not a precise science. So if your doctor or midwife is fine with the way your pregnancy is progressing, then all is, is well. But showing depends on you know, your body, your, you know, what your abdominal muscles, um, whether it's your first or your second pregnancy, your weight at conception, um, you know, where you normally put weight on. There's just so many variables. So that's why, you can't tell a baby by its cover. And, and the come and go belly will eventually become a belly that's always there. It's just gonna take time and every belly is different. Every woman carries differently. Um, and that's just the reality. High, low, all in front, all in back. <laughs> that's how we roll. Thank you, Heidi. But congratulations. Yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. Eric, um, Eric is a twin. My husband, Eric, is a twin. And back in those days, they didn't diagnose twins. They didn't have ultrasound. And so um, what happened was 20 minutes after his brother was born, he showed up. And they had no idea they were having twins. So imagine that. At least you got a heads up there, right? I don't know Modern if you've seen it, but everyone's, um, you're getting a lot of wows from that story, but, um, and it's the way it used to be. Also, she threw up for nine months and gained 13 pounds and, and the twins were five pounds each. So if you can imagine somehow it all worked out, um, they were only slightly preterm. Just what, you know, incredible. The and they were born nature. naturally. Yeah. Doesn't it seem like now, if you find out you're having multiples, they're like C-section, it's happening, we're scheduling it, it's early. Yeah, I, I, I mean, that's not necessarily um, a given. And it might, you know, in some circumstances, obviously it's necessary, but, but not in others. It depends on the baby's positions. So if, if they're both head down, like, you know, God bless. But if they're not, it can be a little trickier. They can end up in all kinds of crazy positions. <laughs> Babies. All right, back to Danielle. Sorry, I'm interrupting. 
No worries. Well, this last one, someone would actually like to know more about your family and how things have changed. So what's the best thing that has changed about pregnancy and parenting since you had Emma? And then perhaps what's the worst? Okay. Well, it's probably both the same thing, um, social media, but I'll get back to that. No, probably the, the, the best thing that has changed is how proud we get to be about our pregnancies, how we get to celebrate them, even when they're not always, you know, so awesome. Like we still are, can be excited and share. Whereas when I was pregnant, you had to wear a polyester pup tent that you could sleep a family of four under back in the, you know, back then, because you, you, you weren't supposed to show that you were pregnant, except like very vaguely, like you could see kind of that you were pregnant, but you weren't supposed to show your belly off. Um, and now the mater oh my God, I wish I could do a do over because the clothes are so cute. And you get, you get to wear tight clothes and anything that you want. You can wear low rise jeans and, you know, have your belly hanging out, whatever. And I didn't get to do that. So that's kind of a bummer. The other thing was we were the first kids on the block um, or in our circle of friends to get pregnant. And so we didn't have um, that network of support necessarily that, you know, others did. So I didn't have any pregnant friends. And now with social media, with, you know, the community on what to expect, you can have, you know, a hundred, a thousand, you got enough time on your hands, you can get a million friends, all who are going through the same experience at, at the same time. And I feel that's very empowering. At the, on the flip side of that, which can be not so good, is when you let yourself get judged or shamed or pressured. Um, and that would be something I, I you know, I, I would, I'm, I'm really, there's no shame in my game. Like I, I, or my books or my app, like you don't, you don't shame other mothers for their choices because every mom is different. Every baby is different. Even for the same mom, two babies are gonna be different. And so you are one of a kind and don't let anyone tell you that you're not and that your choices are not okay. So that's the only downside to social media, but I do feel there's been a lot of, um, a lot of connections that you can make and a lot of reassurance from people around the world. You know, like when I said motherhood is the ultimate sisterhood and you know that a woman in South Africa has a colicky baby at the same time that you do, that's, that's really empowering stuff for me, you know, that you can make those connections. And these are people you wouldn't necessarily ever have met under other circumstances. Um, but because motherhood kind of breaks down all those barriers and social media allows you to do that, I think that's a real positive for the most part. And then stay away from Dr. Google. Do not page Dr. Google. That, you know, I didn't have answers to my questions, so I had to write a book. But let me tell you, now you can have too much information and really inaccurate, misleading um, misinformation or too much information or conflicting information. And that can be just as hard. So for anybody who didn't get the message, if you don't have Heidi's book, get the book and don't Google it. But if they want to keep up with what you're doing on a daily basis, Heidi, what's the best way to, uh, to follow you on social media? Well, it's not really that hard. It's at Heidi Murkoff. So it, you just follow me on Instagram. You can always message me. I answer every question that I get um, on social media. So if anyone's on Twitter, probably not, but I'm, I'm on there if you, if you are, and you can message me there on Instagram, Facebook. Um, you just, you, you have a question, you need to vent, you need a hug. I am so there for you, always. I mean it. Well, I'm seeing that Stephanie is writing in the uh, chat. Facebook is weird for your page. Have you had Facebook issues? I've had, I know, Stephanie, I know, I hate it. So what happened, yeah, the, it 
for some reason in the new Facebook update, they got rid of everybody's ability to post. So like I can post, but nobody really sees it anymore to the extent. So Instagram has been a better bet lately, but I miss it so much. I don't know why Facebook does those things. To those updates powerful. always throw me off. I know, but I, I had this great little thing going on where people could post questions and then all the moms could answer and I could answer. And now it's a lot harder. So the Stephanie's always been there. Thank you for being there, Stephanie. So the book, the app, the social media, Heidi's everywhere. Um, and we really appreciate Heidi that you took an hour out of your evening to spend with us, even a, a little more than an hour, but we really appreciate you answering everyone's questions, being here um, as an open book, literally. Um, and I love that no topic was off the table. So um, thank you so much for being with us tonight. Thank you everyone for joining us. Again.